Let's see if I can find that. Do do. I think so. So, um, question. Do any of you guys like run? You run? Anybody else? I can run. She's not doing. Yeah. So you you run? Anybody, anybody else? Once in a while. Once in a while. Is anyone chasing you? No. Mm, I have a verse for you. This is Proverbs twenty-eight one. It said, "The wicked flee when no one is pursuing, but the righteous are bold as a lion." Something to think about. Something to think about. That's from your brother, of course. Really? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll begin with a word of prayer. So. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day. I thank you for this class. I just ask you to guide our steps today, help us to glorify what we do, and just understand a little bit more about uh, matrix multiplication and their structure and everything. Lord, in my prayer, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, um, oh, here, before I forget, is the attendance sheet. And um, if my computer will wake back up, I'll even give you one of those dreadful codes. Do you guys have any questions while I'm poking at my computer here? Huh, 9200. It's interesting. Your top hat journey today starts with the number 9200. Get me some markers here. All right, so let me um, make a list of some based calculations. So um, I'm just going to gather together a number of different things here and introduce maybe a new one for you guys. So first and foremost, if we have V is an element of Rn, you know, then we know we can write V as like V1 dot dot dot, dot Vn, right? But we can also write it as the sum I equals 1 to N of V sub I E sub I, right? So basically this, this thing here, E1, E2, da 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 En, this is the standard basis, right? We've talked a little bit about this, but let's talk about it again. It's the standard basis for Rn. You can build any vector from it. It's a linearly independent set. It's super useful. All right, so what else can I tell you about the standard basis? Well, one of the really cool things about the standard basis is that it has really, really simple dot products with itself, right? Like EI dot EJ, also known as EI EJ uh, transpose. Does that make sense? It does not. Why not? What's the dot product of two vectors? It's a scalar. It's a number. What am I looking at there? I'm looking at an n by 1 times a 1 by n, which would be a? n by n. So that's something else. We'll come back to what this is in a second. The transpose goes here, right? And with that, it gives you what's called the Kronecker delta. Kronecker delta ij, which is just a sneaky little symbol for 1 for i equals to j, and 0 if i is not equal to j. Super useful notation we should all know about. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the other way around. Um, so, okay, I guess one thing I should mention is, you know, by the way, what happens if we take uh, V dot EJ? What's that do for us? We've got like the sum, I equals 1 to N, of VI, EI. We take the dot product with EJ. What happens when we do that? Properties of the dot product and finite sum says you can pull the constant out and you can pull the sum out, right? So we can rewrite this as simply like a sum 
i equals 1 to n of vi ei dot ej. But what is ei dot ej? As we were just saying, ei dot ej is Kronecker delta ij. Now the Kronecker delta is the natural enemy of the finite sum. It kills it. What does it do? Think about this. If you're summing i equals 1 to n, i is called the dummy variable of summation. Here j is free. j is a free index. So a free index will survive. Um, the dummies die. Hmm. It's like a good life lesson there, I think, maybe. But um, anyway, so this simplifies simply to vj. In short, if you want to select the component, right, with respect to the Cartesian, with respect to the standard basis, just take the dot product with the jth standard basis element that picks off the jth component. You know this from calculus 3 if you've had calculus 3, right? Like the vector dot i hat gives you the x component, the vector dot j hat gives you the y component, the vector dot k hat gives you the z, the z component, right? Or if you're in my class, x hat, y hat, z hat. Now what? So what happens if we reverse the order here? What's the deal with that? Like what if I do, you know, um, EI, EJ transpose, what would that look like? Right? So let me, instead of saying that, let me, let's talk about what the k elf component of it would be. All right? And rather than just writing it down, let me, um, oh, yes. So we learned an identity, right? We learned an identity the other day which is that if you want to select the KL component of a, a matrix, what do you do? You guys remember this? If we want to select the KL component of A, I told you guys what we can do is we can multiply by EK transpose on the left and EL on the right. See what that does? Multiplying EL on the right picks, off the elf, picks out the ELF column, and then multiplying by EK transpose on the right selects the Kth component of that column, which is to say that that's AKL. So I can do the same thing here. See? I can say EK transpose um, EI EJ transpose um, EL, like that, right? That will select the KL component of this. This here is an N by N matrix, right? This is an N by N matrix. All right. But matrix multiplication is associative, right? So check this out. We can write this as EK transpose EI, right? And then you got your EJ transpose EL. How's that go? What were we just talking about? Remember the product of the standard basis transpose and another standard basis is the Kronecker delta. So this right here is a Kronecker delta. Um, I like to write it IK, but you could write it KI. And this is a Kronecker delta JL. In other words, this matrix, we give it a name, we call it EIJ. EIJ um, is equal to matrix with zeros everywhere except the IJth position. where there is a 1. All right, now to keep things simple, I'm talking about it in the square context, but you could also define these for like rectangular matrices. But if I did that, then I'd have to use like the E bar I to have a different size row vector than I have a column vector and stuff like that. So let me not overcomplicate it for class, but so like what does this do for us? Well, check this out. So like if I have, for instance, a matrix A, which is, let's say, A11, A12, A21, A22, I can write that as follows. I can see I can write that as A11, 1, 0, 0, 0, plus A12, 0, 1, 0, 0, plus A21, 0, 0, 1, 0, plus A22, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? 
But what are those? Those are these things I just introduced. These are the so-called matrix units. Matrix units. Um, now, from a math major perspective, it's not a great label because technically they're not a unit in the sense of abstract algebra. These matrices certainly do not have a multiplicative inverse, right? They're mostly zeros. Did you know the zero vector is linearly dependent with all other vectors? It's true. So if you've got a column of zeros in your matrix, the columns are linearly dependent, game over, end of story, right? But this right here is exactly A11, E11, plus A12, E12, plus E21, E21, my bad, A21, A, plus A22, E22, right? So this is pretty neat. Any matrix can be written as a linear combination of the matrix units. So these matrix units play the same role for matrices as the standard basis does for vectors. All right. And there's actually pretty simple rules for how these multiply. All right. Like you can drive how they multiply pretty simply. So I have a whole section on this, which has got a stupid title, which is based on a, a now dead internet meme. Um, all your base there belong to us. It was everywhere when I was in college. Yes, all your base are belong to us, EI and EIJ that is. So this is section 2.7 where I have this and many other formulas. The one other one I'd like to write on the board for you guys, well there's two really. The one is what happens when you multiply, you can work out, you can multiply two of these guys like EIJ, EKL, it actually multiplies really nicely. The way those multiply when you work it out is it gives you chronic or delta JK and then E I L. So that's like how they multiply. It's not exactly a dot product, but it's kind of sort of like a dot product. Um, and then finally, the other thing I should just mention is that this concept generalizes. In fact, we can write any um, A as the sum over I equals one to M, the sum J equals one to N of A I J EIJ. So like any matrix, we can write as a sum of the matrix units if we generalize them to be rectangular. All right. So, any questions? So I sometimes use this notation for examples and stuff, so I just wanted to like talk about it with you guys before you just see it in an example or a homework problem somewhere and have never heard about it before, right? But. This is a nice notation if I want to give you a problem about like a 10 by 10 matrix, but I don't want to write out a 10 by 10 matrix, you know? So something like that. Okay, so let's move on here. Let's talk about um, block multiplication. So. There are various kinds of, uh, in more than just block multiplication, I want to talk about block multiplication and just about some special kinds of matrices, all right? Like matrices with special shapes. Um, there's just a few in here that are, that are most interesting to us. We've already talked a little bit about symmetric and anti-symmetric. Those, of course, would be special shapes, right? Um, and uh, special. Uh, matrices. So let me just get, so just to reiterate the list here, A transpose equals to A is a symmetric matrix, right? There we go. Symmetric matrix. A transpose equals to minus A is an anti-symmetric matrix, or you might call it a skew symmetric matrix. We talked some about those, but what would you say if the matrix looks like this? Let me just make one up. Um, one, two, three, zero, four, five, zero, zero, six. Or B, let's say one, one, one. Um, no, I don't want to put the one on the top. Zero, one, one, uh, zero, zero, three, uh, 
three zero zero zero. Right? Or C. You get this all out of my system all at once here. Um, one, two, three for the column, zero, uh, four, five, zero, zero, six there. Let's let's talk about what these what these are. Okay, so simply this is called a upper triangular matrix. Right? Um, what's what's so and, and what would C be called, what do you think? Lower triangular, Lower triangular right? Cool. Um, how about the middle one? So this is this is also um, upper triangular, but you you might call this strictly upper triangular. All right, and you could also, of course, talk about strictly lower triangular. Listen, if we wanted to come up with a an explicit definition for these things, which was based on the notation I just introduced, how would you do it? Let's think if we could, let's see if we can figure it out. So if A is in Rn by N and A is equal to a sum over I and J of Aij, Eij, all right, then number one number two, number three, uh, number four. A is upper triangular. A is strictly upper triangular. A is lower triangular. A is strictly lower triangular. If, 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 fill in the blank, fill in the blank, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. <sighs> Let's see if we can figure it out. What has to go there? So what, what do we have like for my, my first one? We have, so like this is, let me just remind you guys what the pattern is, right? It's A11, A12, A13, A21, A22, A23, A31, A32, A33, right? So we can think through this. What, what does it mean for it to be upper triangular? It means AIJ is equal to zero if what? For all i, j with what? For all i's greater than j. i, i greater than j. That's right. Strictly upper triangular, same thing, but what? Yep, i greater than or equal to j. See, that forces the diagonal to be zero. And w once you see this, the other two blanks are really easy to fill in, right? You just do what? And, yeah, instead of doing greater than, you do less than. So it's lower triangular if aij is equal to zero for all ij with i less than j and then Aij equal to zero for all Ij with I less than or equal to J. All right. So there you go. That, that you know these are explicit definitions um, of upper and lower triangular, which might be useful to us if we were trying to solve a problem where we don't actually want to write out the matrix because it's just too stupidly large. Right? We can still make arguments using indexes, index calculation if we want to. That said, I'm not going to subject you to that today. I'm just going to tell you a theorem. And the theorem is this. 
it's pretty simple. All right, so here it is. Number one, product of um, upper triangular matrices is upper triangular. <laughs> OK. Try it out. Think about like multiplying this matrix by itself, for instance. You can easily see that you're going to get back 1, 0, 0 for the first column. <clears throat> and like for the second column, when you think about multiplying it, you're going to get something non-zero for the first entry. And then you get something non-zero for the second entry. But for the third entry, you get 0 because you've got these two times those two. Anyway, you, you can easily verify that the product of upper triangular times upper triangular is, again, upper triangular. What about strictly upper triangular? I think the same is true. All right, so you could, you could put in parentheses, like, you know, insert parentheses here strictly. Insert parentheses here strictly. Save us some writing. And likewise, product of parentheses strictly lower triangular matrices is parentheses strictly L lower triangular. Yeah. Alright, so another kind of matrix which is interesting to us, uh, and we'll see that, like, um, well, you guys, are, we've already seen this, right? Like, I think my first example, if the augmented coefficient matrix is triangular, that makes it super easy to solve, right? Because we can just straight use back substitution, and we just tear that thing apart, right? Without even any kind of fancy row reduction or anything. We just back substitute that system and we've, we've got it in no time, right? So triangular matrix is super nice. Another kind of matrix we should talk about <coughs> is this definition A in our n by n is diagonal if A is equal to the sum I equals 1 to n of AII, EII. In other words, it's a matrix which is zero everywhere except possibly the diagonal of the matrix, right? So a diagonal matrix looks like this. And then we, we sometimes we just do like a big zero here and here just say zeros everywhere else. Or sometimes, which is a nicer notation, is a lot of times you'll see this notation. It's understood that wherever you don't write things, it's zero. That's kind of a less cluttered notation, right? Um, when I'm feeling more pedantic, I do something like this. I put a zero here. I put a zero here. I put dot, 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 dot. I put zero down here. I put dot, 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 dot. I put zero over here. I put zero here. And then I put a bunch of dot, 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 dot zeros. And dot, dot, dot. I mean, does that really? Isn't it nicer just to write this? I can't get rid of that. That's a feature of the board. Actually, maybe I can. A diagonal matrix. What do you guys think about the product of diagonal matrices? So I guess I'll call this an example. What if we have A and B both diagonal? Let me just take our notation out for a spin here. So we've got the sum i equals 1 to n of AII, ah, AII, EII times the sum, let's use a j, equals 1 to n, of b, uh, bjj, ejj. But by um, linearity of the matrix product and the fact that we can pull scalars out, we can you know, just trade this for a sum over i and j. Um, 
equals 1 to n. Pull our a i i and our b j j out. And what we got? We got e i i times e j j. All right? But what did, I guys, what did I tell you guys a little bit earlier about the product of the matrix units? How did that go? Remember? So like E, so the way this works out is if you apply the rule I wrote earlier, this becomes just Kronecker delta IJ, EIJ. Right, Kronecker delta EIJ, EIJ. And so we can either kill the sum over i or the sum over j. What do you guys want to do? Keep the i or keep the j? Actually, the choice is clear. We keep the j. So I like the j. All right, so that gives me, so if you impose that, that means i equals to j. So I get ajj, bjj, ejj. <laughs> All right, which is just a diagonal matrix. In other words, if I write it out, it's like this, right? It's A11, B11, A12, B. My A12, listen to me, no. A22, B22, da 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 da, ANN, BNN. So the product of two diagonal matrices is a diagonal matrix where you simply multiply the diagonals. It's so simple. Product of diagonal matrices, super nice. All right? So what's the deal? Um, so th that's, those are the main special types of matrices you run across. In applications, you might run across ones that are like called um, tri-diagonal, like a tri-diagonal matrix is one where you have only non-zero entries on the diagonal and above and below, like the diagonal line that just goes above the, the diagonal or right below. So you could have like a, um, a tri-diagonal matrix. Those come up in applications sometimes. Things like that. But the other main idea that I should share with you guys is the idea of block multiplication. All right? And so the idea of block multiplication is simply this. Um, if you can take your matrix and you can look at it as being subdivided into matrices of a smaller type, all right? And you can do that for two matrices, right? So you've got two matrices. So let me just start out with something like relatively simple. So you could have like, um, let's say A1, B1, C1, D1, like this. And then suppose you've got another matrix of the same um, exact uh, subdivision, B, A, A, A2, B2, C2, D2, like that. So I'm not saying that here A, B, C, D, sub I, I equals 1 to 2. I'm not, I'm not saying those are numbers. I'm saying those are themselves matrices. And for the sake of being simple to start with, let's suppose that, like, let's just keep it simple. Let's suppose that A, A sub I, uh, A sub, well, yeah, A sub I, B sub I, C sub I, D sub I, um, all N by N matrices i equals to 1 and 2. All right, that, that way, that's just one case. All right, but just to get us started, let's suppose that. Um, so if that's the case, it turns out the way you multiply such things is just to treat it as if they're just numbers. So how would you, if these are just numbers, how would you multiply this? You go what, like this times that, right? You'd have like A1, a2, I say just like they're numbers, but I'm not being entirely truthful with you because all of a sudden it matters what order the letters are in. So the letters coming from the left matrix must stay on the left in the subsequent product, and the letters on the right must stay on the right in the terms in the subsequent product. Like so A1, A2, B1, C2, like that. And so you guys tell me what goes down here. What do I put here? Oh, no. We must put C1 first. The ones have to be first. So, but right idea, C1, A2, and then plus what? D1, C2, very good. And up here? A1, B2, plus B1, 
D2, yeah. And then down here, finally, we got our C1, B2, plus D1, D2. That's it. This is all block multiplication says, is that if you've got a matrix of blocks, and the blocks are multipliable for two matrices that are side by side, you can multiply the matrix of blocks as if the blocks are just numbers, provided we keep track of the, you know, the, the left factors have to stay on the left, the right factors have to stay on the right, because matrix multiplication does not commute. This is block multiplication. I'll do one over here. <laughs> so I said that you know, we were, we've, we've exhausted the kinds of special uh, matrices, but that's not entirely true. There is also a kind of matrix called a block diagonal matrix. All right? And um, so I've told you guys you can't add matrices of dissimilar sizes. Um, that's only partially true. So it becomes untrue once I show you what I'm about to show you. However, so that there's no confusion, we have kindly invented a different symbol for adding matrices of dissimilar sizes. All right, so I'll show you how that goes. So this is, uh, here's how it goes. Oh. Oh, man. I've forgotten how to number examples today. That's not good. So suppose you have like one, two, three, four, and then this is what we do. Plus, all right, so we can do six, seven, eight, that diagonal matrix, all right? Now, fine, I'll put some ones up here. So this plus with a circle means that we're making a new matrix of a larger size. And the way we do it is we make it a block matrix. And here's how it goes. We put one, two, three, four, in the upper block, like that, and then we put six, one, zero, zero, seven, one, zero, zero, eight, in this lower block, like that. And then there's zeros elsewhere. So when I ask you guys questions about is it possible to uh, you know, add matrices and stuff, this is not on the table of discussion when I ask that question, all right? So like I should, if I don't, I should be careful to say something like, with respect to the standard definition of matrix addition and multiplication, is it possible to make these operations, all right? That would be the full and proper wording of that problem. On the other hand, if you allow this, um, what's called exterior sum sometimes, you can make new size matrix from old, all right? And the beautiful thing here is, let's, let's give this thing a name. Let's just call it A. All right? So this basically has the pattern A1, 0, 0, A2, right? So this is an example. That, a matrix that looks like that, a matrix which has got possibly non-zero blocks down the diagonal, and then zero blocks off the diagonal is called a block diagonal matrix. <coughs> this is called a block diagonal matrix. So the cool thing is, if you're multiplying like a, mu a block diagonal matrix times another block diagonal matrix, for example, A squared, which is A times A, right? That looks like a1, 0, 0, A2, times A1, 0, 0, A2. And what did we just learn about multiplying diagonal matrices? You do what? You multiply the diagonals. Same is true for a block diagonal matrix. So this becomes like, you know, A1, A1, plus 0, 0, 0, and A2, A2 when you work through it. So, in other words, you just got what? 
I mean, you can figure out what, what is one, two, three, four squared, what do you get? Uh, one plus six, seven, three plus, three plus 12, 15, two plus eight, 10, um, six plus 16, 22, I think. So I get a, uh, yeah, seven, 10, 15, 22, if I work it out. And what happens down here on the six, what happens when we multiply, you know, six one zero, zero seven one, zero zero eight by itself. I get a 30, I'm going to get 36, 49, 64 on the diagonal. And then I'm going to get, um, let's see here, 6, 13 up here, and um, I think 15 here, and I believe I get a 1 up here. And zeros down here. Okay, so there that is. 36, 13, 1, 0, 49, 15, 0, 0, 64. And then there's zeros on the off, off diagonal. So block diagonal matrices actually play a really special role in the big picture story of this course. So I'm, we're just introducing the terminology at the moment. And um, this idea of block multiplication is actually kind of surprising, right? That you can treat a matrix as if it's made of smaller matrices, which kind of behave like numbers, you know? That, that to me was surprising that that works. I personally learned about this in a quiz in grad school. As I was stuck on a problem and the professor was leaning over my paper as he walked around and helped people, helped people, and he was just like, James, use the blocks, use, use the blocks. This meant nothing to me though, because I didn't know block multiplication, so he was just telling me use the blocks, and I'm thinking, what blocks? What are you talking about? See, the problem I was looking at was simple if I knew block multiplication, but otherwise it required multiplication of matrices as if they're a box of scalars. Right? It's the difference between building the foundation for a Lego castle with regular sized bricks versus building it with Duplos. You know, the block multiplication is like using Duplos. It's super helpful if you're not interested in the details. Okay, so there's that. So that brings us to, I, feel there, I guess there's a few other talks I should have to you guys about like the structure of matrix algebra, and we'll, we'll circle back to that. And certainly there's more calculations to look at in my uh, section 2.8.4 on block matrices. Um, I actually work out there an example 2.8.16, like the, the formula for the inverse of a, uh, a matrix with two by two blocks, with like blocks where three of them are non-zero and like there's a zero in the lower block. That's kind of horrible. And there's all kinds of um, things to say about how Block multiplication allows you to uh, vastly simplify large problems. Like if you can look at your system of equations and identify that it can be you know, like decomposed in some sort of block diagonal fashion, that essentially means you can split it into two systems, which you can solve that system and you can solve that system separately. And so like the, complexity, like the calculational complexity of a problem for you in an application, it goes like n squared, where n is the size of the matrix. Five squared, it's pretty big. Comparatively speaking, two squared and three squared are smaller. Right, that's kind of a minor thing, right? What's two, two squared is four, three squared is nine, right? Four plus nine, 13 ish. Five is, five squared, 25 ish. This becomes much, much bigger a distinction as you get to bigger blocks and compare the size of the total size of your system squared versus the sum of the size of squares of smaller blocks. 
that's essentially the computational saving of if you can identify for the particulars of your system some kind of block decomposition in the problem you're looking at it's a vast calculational simplification you can make much faster code and convince people to pay you money right that's what you'd like be a better programmer than the next guy that kind of thing um, so block, block matrices can be very helpful in that regard so what, the time that remains I'm going to I'm going to show you a calculational technique without any justification so this is just gonna be just pure cookbookery all right not 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 just just nothing more than just magical what did he do why does that work I'm not explaining it to you so I'm I'm, I'm pretending I'm a math magician for a second I'm just going to show you the trick I'm not going to explain it to you why it works the why it works will come next class perhaps so um, it turns out <clears throat> a matrix can be decomposed into something called the LU decomposition you might say what is the L? Well, the L is for lower triangular. The U is for upper triangular. All right. Oh, man. Yeah, it's still mostly white. Um, <clears throat> so I have an example, which I will show you guys. So I, I made a few examples. So this is actually in the appendix to my notes, all right? And <laughs> Lay is not bad here, but he's not as good as my notes. There's something I do in my notes which I learned from my brother, which is like super sneaky and makes the problem like easy. Here it goes. So example, I guess, well, it's example one from my handout, so I'm gonna stick with that. I'm gonna put some quotes around it. <laughs> so here we go. A equals two, one minus one, three, two, four, one, zero, six, two, one, four, five. All right. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do row two minus four, row one. All right. So one minus one, three, two, unaltered. Of course, two, one, four, five, unaltered. And we get a five minus 12 and a minus two here. And now for something a little bit different. I'm going to put it in red for the sake of you guys. We put a four here. You're like, isn't that supposed to be a zero? No, we're doing the LU decomposition magical calculation. So let's continue. All right, so uh, R3, and I, I hope you know I really don't like doing this sort of thing. So the fact that I'm sharing with you this, it's kind of like me sharing with you some sort of like sing-song trick to remember derivatives in calculus one. You won't catch me doing it because um, I hate that stuff so much. Like I, anyway, I digress. All right, so three minus two, one. I'll keep with my color coding here. Oh man. So if I put a four before, what do I put now? A, a two in parentheses, right? Okay, good. Cool, cool, cool. Next up, we do our three minus three fifths our two. That gets me one minus one, three, two for my top row. Nothing changed up there. And my black entry, well, the second row doesn't change either. But my third row has now got a, and I, you know, you could calculate out for this one, 26 fifths and 11 fifths for the unparentheses ones. And of course, you still got your, still got your, uh, your four up there. You got your two here. You got your now um, three fifths. They're down there in the, uh, whatchamacallit there, the four two spot. So what up next? Well, all right. No, oh, that's it. All right, so from this, I can see that, aha, A is equal to 
Check it out, yo. One, zero, zero, four, one, zero, two, three fifths, one, and one minus one, three, two, zero, five, minus twelve, minus two, zero, zero, twenty six over five, eleven over five. And you can check me on it. Try multiplying those matrices. Try it. You'll like it. Mm-hmm. Good matrix multiplication. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm an idiot. But um, this is what we could call a lower triangular matrix. This is what we can call an upper triangular matrix. This is the LU decomposition. Do you see, so the, I put the zeros back where they should have been for the row reduction, right? And the things in parentheses, I adjoined to the identity matrix to get the L, right? And that is how you find the LU decomposition. Now there are, sometimes you need a permutation matrix. We'll talk more about that next time. But for the moment, let's just see how this helps us solve a system. So like, what if you're solving? You're solving like AX equals to, you know, what do you guys want? Let's say one, two, three, just for the sake of specificity, right? What, what, what would you be solving then in this situation? Does that even make sense? Yeah, it does, okay, sorry. A is three by four, so I should, I, my, this X has to be a four component vector, right? But look at what you're solving then, you're solving L u x equals to this one, two, three, let's say. So what you can do then is let u x equals to y, then you're just looking at l y equals to one, two, three. Um, right? But the thing is, Ly equals to 1, 2, 3 is easy to solve. Do you see that? Like that's, you know, um, y1 equals to 1, 4y1 plus y2 equals to 2, 2y1 plus 3 fifths y2 um, plus y3 equals to 3 right? Because L is that. So the coefficient matrix is just this, right? So what's the solution? I got the first one. You guys give me the second one. <laughs> You're like, hey, you did the easy part. So Y2 would be what? 2 minus 4 Y1, 2 minus 4 minus 2. What's Y3 equal to? No, it's unpleasant. Y3, actually, okay, so Y3, I might actually have to pick up my calculator and think for a second, but 3 minus 2 um, minus 3 fifths of y2, which is minus 2. So wh what's that work out to? Help me out. I don't want to keep you guys here all day. What's 1, what's one plus 6 fifths? 11. 11 fifths. All right, great. So then Behold, we have the problem, you know, u times x1, x2, x3, x4 equals to uh, 1 minus 2, uh, 11 fifths. Where u is this. So you can solve that relatively easily. Yeah. I don't think I have time, but... My point is, if you have an LU decomposition, you can use this substitution idea to solve triangular systems, one and then substitute into the other, like that. This becomes much easier if my matrix was square, right? Whenever it's a rectangular matrix, you're dealing with like a solution set. So there's, you know, that's still something you guys are getting used to, right? Hopefully you'll be completely used to it before the test though, right? 
too soon? No? Okay. Like we're just worried about our physics two physics two quiz next next term. We yep. have time for this mumbo jumbo about matrices. Um, anyway, so I should do a few more examples of this, and I do have um, I, I, I wrote up about three or four more examples. My notes have like three examples, um, but anyway, so I'll try to explain why this works next time. It's not particularly hard to understand why this works, but I shall shut up for now. Thanks, guys. <laughs>